Since the dawn of mankind, people have had a fascination with capturing the world in a secondary form, to preserve and consume it in a way different to reality itself. Cave paintings were the first version of this desire to experience an alternate reality. Cave paintings led to classical paintings and drawings, then those led to photography and eventually the birth of digital reality. Video games, social media, videos, and more. There's something about a human-made world that seems more comforting than reality itself. People want to believe in purpose and reason, something reality is often devoid of. An easy way to feel these things is to visit a world created by designers of purpose and reason, a virtual reality. As this sentence on Wikipedia says, the exact origins of virtual reality are disputed. For the sake of simplicity, however, let's just go with this thing for the jumping off point of our origin story. A filmmaker named Morton Hellig is to blame for the creation of this device. He was dissatisfied by the typical theater experience of his time, and so in 1957, he invented a machine that was capable of tilting, had stereoscopic 3D color displays, binaural audio, and even odor emitters. He called it the Sensorama. After Halleck patented the Sensorama in 1962, it was in use until at least the 1980s. But by that time, there were others trying to dip their toes into the virtual world. NASA, for instance, was interested in VR technology for its simulation and training capabilities. So in collaboration with VPL Research, the VIEW headset was developed. It is important to note that of the two collaborators, VPL was the one to give credit for this headset. This company was one of the first companies to commercially sell VR products such as the Data Glove and the Data Suit, both of which NASA used in conjunction with the VIEW headset. Speaking of the VIEW headset, VPL released their own version of the headset called the iPhone. iPhone. It used the same display as the VIEW headset and was also sold commercially. The CEO of VPL, Jaron Lanier, is actually the person who popularized the term virtual reality. And hearing this man describe virtual reality makes it seem like his technology is a gateway into not just a virtual world, but a borderline spiritual one. Well, this is our virtual reality glove. It's called a data glove. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you can put on this glove and the glove lets you feel a world that doesn't exist as if it's real and pick up things in the world as if they're real. So it lets you reach into uh, an imaginary world. And um, these are the special glasses called the iPhones that you put on. And um, when you put them on, you're seeing inside an imaginary world instead of inside the physical world. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is that by wearing computerized clothing right over your sense organs, you transport your sensory system into a reality that can be of any description. With VR gradually becoming more and more popular, video game companies started looking into the applications of VR peripherals for video games. Atari decided to give it a shot and started a research lab in 1982, but their virtual ambitions were quickly squashed by the video game crash of 1983. Fast forward to the 90s and Sega announces the Sega VR, a headset that was meant to be used with the Sega Genesis. Four games for this system were being made during its development, but the project was eventually cancelled. All four of those games, in addition to the headset were thrown out. Now let's talk about the Sega VR's rivalrous counterpart, the Virtual Boy. This headset, with its black and red displays, was an instant failure, mostly because it wasn't even a VR headset. More accurately, it was a pair of goggles on a stand that provided a 3D perspective by showing two slightly different images to each eye. Compared to everything else that had been developed up to this time, this thing was a huge step back, and it single-handedly ruined the reputation of VR because it overshadowed the true ingenuity of other, more sophisticated VR devices. Now granted, Nintendo has always been about the quality of their games as opposed to the sophistication of their consoles. The problem is that VR was an underdeveloped medium, so Nintendo needed to focus on the technology in order to convince people that it was worth buying. The Virtual Boy failed at this, and the reputation of VR as a gaming medium suffered because of it.
According to Wikipedia, there was little interest in VR during the 2000s. If I were to speculate, this is probably because the Virtual Boy put an aggressively wet blanket over the VR hype train. With the exception of a room-scale installation in Lavelle, France, and the introduction of Google Street View in 2007, almost nothing in the way of VR development was taking place. But then... A new company creates a Kickstarter page, revealing a new innovation, the Oculus Rift. On the very same day the page was made, the $250,000 goal was completely blown away. For the first time since the Virtual Boy, a company was making a headset specifically for video games. People went crazy for it. In 2013 and 2014, Oculus released developer kit versions of the Rift, called DK1 and DK2 respectively. YouTubers such as PewDiePie, Jacksepticeye, and Markiplier made gameplay videos with these headsets. This no doubt promoted Oculus and rekindled the excitement that was once felt for VR as a gaming medium in the 80s and 90s. Valve worked with Oculus at this time, developing another prototype headset, which Mark Zuckerberg got to try out in 2014. Impressed by the technology and seeing the buzz around VR, Zuckerberg decided to buy Oculus for $2.3 billion. The frenzy created by the Oculus Rift rippled through the gaming industry. Hundreds of companies began developing and researching VR technology. Valve in particular took their prototype headset and in collaboration with HTC, transformed it into the Vive. Sony also announced that they were working on their own headset, the PlayStation VR, codename Project Morpheus. In 2016, the Vive, PSVR, and Oculus Rift CV1 would all be released to great success. This essentially leads us to today, where we have hundreds of VR headsets to choose from with their own screen resolutions, tracking methods, controllers, and so on. It's incredible to see how much this technology has changed over the last half century, but it's hard not to think about the greater implications of technology like this at submerging yourself in a world like Jaron Lanier described. I can see people getting lost in the virtual world, unwilling to return to true reality because of the fear of the unknown. I almost feel like... Uh, Chief? Joel? Rave. Rave. Yes, my message.